Nice buns. Soft, fluffy, and ultra low net carbs. Discover Hero Bread, the delicious ultra low net carb bread with incredible taste and texture. Hero Bread has zero grams of sugar and is under 100 calories per serving. Plus, high in fiber with 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving. Available on Amazon.com, Walmart.com, and at Hero.co. That's H-E-R-O dot C-O. Delicious, ultra-low net carb Hero Bread buns and tortillas. Soft and fluffy, high in fiber, and with zero grams of sugar, up to 10 grams of protein, coming in at under 100 calories. Order today at Hero.co and use the code AH10 to get 10% off your first purchase. That's AH10 at Hero.co, H-E-R-O dot C-O. Order from Hero.co now and get 10% off your first purchase with promo code AH10. That's 10% off with code AH10, H-E-R-O dot C-O. This is Naked Pine. M.I.P. With Masamela Matsumo. Mark Thompson. Naked Pine. Get woke. Good morning and happy 2021 again. Just as the Georgia elections were last night and now today. The certification of the Electoral College results and the Proud Boys descend upon Washington, D.C. We want to share with you a town hall we did right after the November presidential election with all of the civil rights leadership discussing the impact of the presidential election on the African-American community and the pan-African world. Convened by the Institute of the Black World 21st Century our host city, Newark, New Jersey, and Mayor Roz Baraka. My co-moderator is Dr. Julianne Malvo, and of course, uh, representing the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, Dr. Ron Daniels. Hope you'll enjoy. Good evening. I'm Dr. Ron Daniels, president of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this crucial national town hall meeting where we have assembled some of Black America's brightest and best to share their perspectives on the impact of the most, one of the most consequential elections in the history of these United States of America. Consequences on Black America and by extension, the Pan-African world. We are pleased that this extraordinary gathering is being broadcast by the Real News Network, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, Free Speech Television, WPFW 89.3 FM, Pacifica, Washington, D.C., WBAI 99.5 FM, uh, Pacifica, New York, the station where I'm proud to host Vantage Point every Monday, 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock p.m. Yes, delighted to be able to do that. Before we start our program, I would like to call on Dr. Ivor Carruthers, the visionary general secretary of the Samuel D. Wood Proctor Conference, a progressive faith organization committed to bending the moral arc of the universe towards justice. Dr. Ivor Carruthers, would you please lead us in our invocation? Thank you so much, Dr. Daniels. Good evening, my beloved family. In the name of all that is sacred and holy, that is good and pleasing, and that is loving and unifying, I greet you this evening. Once again, we have answered the call to convene under the banner of the Institute of the Black World 21st Century, the watchful eyes of the many powerful ancestors who are presiding over our time on the earth and the omnipotent God who has ultimate sovereignty. We have gathered with the question of the State of the Black World Conference 5 assessing the impact of the 2020 presidential election on Black America and the Pan-African world. In that spirit, I call forth the ancestral presence of AME Bishop Henry McNeil Turner, who in 1896 said about the presidential race between Bryan and McKinley, to go out and get our people to vote, but ultimately understand that the prize is the agenda after which you vote. We must be committed to stand and tell the truth, leave our comfort zones of business as usual, and do the hard work of running with endurance until the work is finished. In this moment of multiple pandemics and the death rattle of empire, Our truth has been revealed to the world. 
It's up to us to turn our truth into a story with the ending that we want. Theologian womanist Dr. Katie Cannon advises for such a time as this, that even when people call your truth a lie, you must tell it anyway. And so I call forth their memory in this moment because their words of wisdom tells us that the impact of the election and its yet to be determined results is not based on who is elected, but whether we have a unified vision, agenda, and a plan of action, regardless of who is elected. And to that end, God, we have gathered to solidify the collective wisdom, the shared infrastructures which our organizations represent, and a vision, not for just us in the United States, but for the entire Pan-African world. We are not ashamed of the gospel nor our identity. We are an African people made in the image of God and our agenda is the agenda that says shadow beneath thy hand, may we forever stand true to the land and true to our native land. And so we lift up a vision for a plan of action that is grounded in communal interest. We have a vision for self-determinant accountability that won't let you slide because of the color of your skin. We have a vision for a new world coming that is informed by that which is necessary for the future of our children yet oh born. Oh, Holy One, you have witnessed how hard those represented here tonight have fought for human dignity of our people as the votes continue to be counted. Be in the rooms to make sure that evil and empire don't have their way. Be in the hearts and minds of those who represent to embrace this moment, not as the end of an election, but as the beginning of a renewed quest for our liberation. Mother and father of time and all of creation, be with us in this space, not uttering empty words of self-proclamation, but bringing offerings of commitments that affirm principles of Ubuntu, I am because you are. And for the many of our people who don't have the luxury of convening in a living room or on Zoom, we honor the sacrifices of those who made the way for us. We celebrate those who believe as we do, that we've come too far to turn back now. And so, O oh African peace, Prince of Peace and Spirit that divides the door of no return, let it be said that on this day, November 5th, we came not to celebrate or miserate, but to look forward and up with a mind and a heart to use our radical imaginations, our unlimited genius, and our love for one another to create a different world. We pray for the third eye and the transcendent spirit to know that what we do in this corner of the world can radiate the energy to transform the world. So may our time here this evening bear fruit for generations yet unborn. We are the ones we have been waiting for, and so it is. So it is, Ashe and Amen. Ashe and Amen. Ashe and Amen. Ashe and Amen. What a powerful uh, prayer. Again, I say and amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Iva Carruthers. Uh, I would now like to invite artist, educator, human rights activist, and sister, uh, and, and human rights activist, Sister Ayana Gregory, to sing the Black National Anthem and the South African Anthem as only she can do. Sister Ayana. Sing. Till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing the song full of the faith that our dark past has taught us and sing a song full of the hope that our present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on until victory is won. In Kosi Sikeleli, Africa, Malupakan Yisu Pondulwayo, 
Izwaimitandazo yetu inkosi sikelela tina lusapulwayo wouza moya wouza moya wouza moya wouza moya wouza moya Oh, ying wele, who see seek a leila, Tina Lusa Pulwayo. Yo. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Sister Ayana. That's Dick Gregory's daughter. And I know he's smiling down on Sister Ayana. We, we so love her and appreciate her. I know Dr. Ife is jumping up and down because she has, uh, you know, she has Dick Gregory with her on every one of her shows on WPFW. So, again, thank you, Sister Ayana. Next, please welcome our host, the Honorable Raz J. Baraka, Mayor of Newark, New Jersey, one of the most progressive mayors in this country, to bring greetings and welcome. Uh, Mayor Baraka, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening. Just want to thank uh, Ron Daniels, Dr. Daniels, for consistently uh, partnering with us here in the city of Newark to bring you the state of the black world. Uh, it is important uh, that we have this discussion, particularly now uh, in the middle of this election. Uh, and I want to thank all of the panelists and all of the speakers. And of course, uh, uh, Danny Glover, who we love tremendously, who consistently comes here all of the time, whether it's in person or virtual, <laughs> come here and uh, you know shows us his love and gives us information uh, at the same time. Uh, right now, you know, uh, in this election process, 58% uh, of white men have uh, cast their ballots and are casting their ballots for Donald Trump, and 55% of white women uh, have have done the same so far. Uh, in, 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 in contrary, 80% of black men uh, have already voted for Donald Trump and 91% of black women have, excuse me, have, have excuse me, 80% have voted for Joe Biden, black men, and 91% have, uh, black women have voted for uh, Joe Biden, which shows uh, the deep dichotomy uh, in the way we see uh, this country, the direction that it's going, uh, and what's good for us. Uh, and, and good for democracy. And so this, this this discussion is incredibly important. And I know you're going to have a robust one. The thousands of people, the tens of thousands of people in the city of Newark appreciate each time you come here. It's not only impactful for us, but we know it's impactful for every municipality around this country where we are uh, and where people are struggling for freedom, justice, and equality uh, and an inclusive democracy where uh, everybody can be represented. Uh, and we know that these discussions are important, as I said before to, to Dr. Daniels, that uh, it's important because we need to have our discussions on the national table. Uh, the, uh, the things that we'll be discussing tonight are not going to be discussed at any of these debates. They're not the exit poll questions. They're not even the entry poll questions. These are things that we need to discuss uh, that will help us advance ourselves and our families here uh, in America and in this and, and in this world uh, that we're in now, so it's incredibly, incredibly important. I'm just glad to be here, uh, glad to host it as usual, and thank all of you for your courage, uh, your inspiration, uh, uh, and the information that you're going to give hundreds of thousands of people this evening. God bless you. Thank you so much, Mayor Baraka, for uh, again hosting, and uh, uh, you will be hearing more from Mayor Baraka and special guest Danny Glover. Uh, at the end of the program. So stick around. Uh, you'll, you'll be hearing from him uh, in his own inimitable way at the conclusion of the program. As I mentioned, uh, we're living through and witnessing one of the most consequential moments in the history of people of African descent on these hostile shores. A moment that can only be described as perilous and dangerous for Black, Amer Black America, for our families and our communities. Indeed, a moment of great danger for this nation. This is the context, the backdrop for this national town hall meeting. To moderate this discussion, I'm honored to introduce two longtime friends and allies of IBW, 
both of whom are also commissioners on the National African American Reparations Commission. First, Dr. Julianne Malfo. Already, uh, we've seen her described as, I believe, you know, by self-determination, we can declare what we believe. She is Black America's leading political economist and president emeritus of Bennett College for, for Women, in, and she's from Washington, D.C., but she's obviously much more. Reverend Mark Thompson, longtime friend, social and political activist, host of Make It Plain podcast, and he has become de facto the moderator of everything significant marches, rallies. I mean, he is the go-to person uh, for that experience. And I'm, I'm just reminded this is the 25th anniversary of the Million Man March, and he was, of course, the moderator of that great event. They will facilitate this conversation with this amazing assembly of leaders, and they are Mark Moriel, President and CEO of the National Urban League, Derek Johnson, President and CEO of the NACP from Baltimore, Maryland, S. Todd Yeri, President and, and C, a vice, Senior Vice President of Rainbow Push Coalition out of Chicago, Dr. E. Favorite Williams, President and, of the, the Nas, President and CEO of the National Congress of Black Women out of Washington, D.C., Melanie Campbell, President of the Coalition of Black Civic Participation, Washington, D.C., Barbara Arnwine, President founder and president of the Transformative Change Coalition, Washington, D.C. Marbury Stolly Butts, convener, policy table, the Movement for Black Lives. I think she is uh, will be joining us uh, shortly. She had to drop off for a minute. And uh, Jaziri X, hip-hop activist and founder of One Hood Media from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And that's my part of the country because I grew up in part in the Hill District up that way. So I have a special affinity for the city of Pittsburgh. Janice, Attorney Janice Mathis, Executive Director of the National Council of Negro Women, Washington, D.C. Pastor Michael McBride, Director of Urban Strategy, Faith and Action from Berkeley, California. Larry Hamm, Chairman of the People's Organization for Progress in Newark, New Jersey. And Fred Rica Bay, Women in Support of the Million Man March and, and how they did support the Million Man March. So, Dr. Malvo and Reverend Mark, let's let the discussion begin. Absolutely. Let's get it on. So, Mark, how are you feeling? Uh, it's, um, you know, 48 hours or 36. How are you feeling about what's going on? Um, well, uh, I'm feeling okay, <laughs> I guess. We're all watching with um, um, bated breath. Um, what these results are going to be. But once again, obviously, uh, the black community uh, has made a difference. Uh, and it's been the black community pretty much um, that once again has had to save America. I, um, I think that there's a lot more reckoning that has to take place that so many people voted for someone um, who's done a lot of terrible things. But the latest terrible thing is to allow so many people to die in a pandemic. And I know this is cultural for some of the whites that voted for him, um, but some of them are, are dying too. And so to me, you know, uh, for for that support to be there, he kind of is a, is, is a, a Jim Jones in some regard, but <laughs> Jim Jones had religion. Uh, and if they want to support the white supremacists, we can find one <laughs> it's not killing people um, in a pandemic. So we've got a lot of work to do. And I think it's high time we demand our respect for once again, as an African-American electorate, uh, saving America. You know, I'm a native San Francisco. I remember that time and that Kool-Aid that was drunk and the extent to which we believe that there was a great white savior. Not we, but some people. People turned over their property. They did all of that. Are we doing that again? I am. I think that there's got to be a reckoning with the Democratic Party. I think there's got to be a reckoning uh, with our people. I don't understand these 18% of black men who voted for Trump. I just don't understand that. And I want to hear from my brothers. But, you know, we're not going to, um, we could talk about this all day because, you know, you and I chop it up all the time. What I'm going to do directly is go to uh, Derek Johnson, our 
uh, president of the NAACP, our esteemed president of the NAACP. Okay, somebody is like Googled it up some all of this. Is that Larry Ham drinking some up? Larry, what you chugging? Um, but uh, Derek, what does this say about race in America? For white supremacist attitudes still exist. Is it embedded in our public policy? But until we are able to get control of governance and change the public policy that have directed our lives for decades, we're going to continue to see the bubbling up of the structural systems that's racing inherently and the white supremacist mindset that always run towards culture, even if it's in, uh, against their best interest. Does, you, does, does any of this resonate with you in the NAACP in terms of reconstruction? It's all the same. I mean, if you think about the end of Reconstruction, a period called Redemption, much of the rhetoric that was being used in 1875 and 1876, you hear it now around uh, 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 concerning voting and, and, and blacks allegedly stealing the elections or casting illegal votes. It's the same rhetoric repackaged for a new day. It is all based in this concept that working class whites feel more entitled because of skin privilege not because of merit. And as a result of this feeling of entitlement, when they are not able to meet whatever their aspirations mm -hmm. are, and they see Black folks particularly being able to exceed what they thought was a, a caste system, then they fall back to this cultural norm of white supremacy and reacting in ways in which uh, that's also familiar in the South, but, but it's been so nationalized under Trump. Uh, that that is no longer dog whistle. It's just a standard way in which many in the Republican Party have been operating. And for that matter, the Democratic Party, because racism don't have a political affiliation, just have a mindset. Mark? Thank you. Um, Janice Mathis, question for you. Was the Biden-Harris message and messaging conducive to generating the best black voter turnout. Do we have Janice? Yes, I had to unmute myself. Good evening. Good Thank evening. you so much for being a part of this gathering tonight. It is a wonderful experience to be among my sheroes and heroes who are in the trenches each and every day. In terms of the turnout, we don't know exactly what the turnout is yet because we haven't seen the measurements, but it appears that young folk are voting in larger numbers, and that's a good thing. In terms of the messaging, the sense that I got, Mark, was that we were what I like to call self-propelled voters. Mm -hmm. We weren't motivated so much by the message as we were motivated by our moral inclination to change the course of this nation back to something that is slightly more rational. That is not to say that the Democrats are saviors or salvation, but then we are the Democrats. We are those pragmatic politicians beginning in the 1940s who invaded the party of the slave owners, ran them out, recreated the party in our own image and in the image of Jesse Jackson and, and other heroes of that era. And so I wasn't worried so much about the message. I was worried about some change and what we could do to money. And I had the sense that that's where black folk were during this, during this time. All right, thank you. Julianne? I want to go to Mark Moore. Real, who is the president and CEO of the National Urban League. Uh, Mark, um, thank you. Love you, love you dearly. Love you, love you. What do these election results, we don't have all the end, but what does it say about African Americans versus other people around COVID? You know, we're twice as likely to die, three times as likely to be diagnosed. What, you know, it seems like some folks don't give a you know who. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of, I'm proud of black America. Black America is masked up. Black America is physically and socially distanced. I think black Americans have taken great care and great do, uh, even in a nation and even without a national plan. Uh, and I think that black Americans want, understand that you can't reopen the nation's economy without getting past COVID. Uh, the way in which COVID has affected us, I mean, the deaths, for some, it may be numbers. For some of us, it's friends. Some of us, it's family members. Uh, I've had COVID. My wife's had COVID, you know, at the very beginning of the process, before there was even uh, a test available. 
Uh, this has permeated our community. What about and, your kids, babe? What about your well, kids? Are they okay? My kids are fine. Yeah, my kids are fine. And, and, and we had it very early. And in fact, I really didn't know I had it until I took an antibody test many, many months later. Uh, so Black Americans, I think, uh, want uh, an open economy, but understood and, and responded to the idea that you've got to tackle COVID, which was not just, I think, Black people understanding. I think the common sense uh, point of view with respect to uh, with respect to this this very wicked pandemic that's exposing not only health disparities but a broken uh, public health system in America, a broken system of care. Uh, broad, broad change uh, must be done uh, to the public health system in the in the country. Uh, and where there's a crisis, there's a chance to have a different conversation. And uh, you know the the election results are not yet complete. Uh, there will be a window an opportunity to implement an agenda. But here's what we have to learn. This has been a year of protest. It's been a year of perhaps unprecedented African-American turnout. Look at these election returns. It's the votes in Milwaukee. It's the votes in Detroit. It's the votes in Flint. It's the votes in Pittsburgh. It's the votes, votes in Atlanta, Augusta, and Savannah. It's the votes of black people that are propelling this narrow mar these narrow margins in these states. And I'm like you, Julianne, I'm looking for the 20% brothers uh, who quote unquote, I don't believe those numbers and I wanna know where those numbers come from. I think it's some more, some more fake faking and jaking, but be that as it may, uh, we have uh, uh, to understand as, uh, as Mark indicated uh, in the early, uh, early going quoting 1896, it's about the agenda. We have to be focused on the agenda and what kind of energy, advocacy we have to put behind the things we want to see. And we can't shirk from it. The last thing I'll say is one election is one election. Uh, I hope that what we do is remain politically and civically engaged and, and that we're prepared to use every tool that's available, be it protest or voting or organizing or public policy convening. We've got to use all the tools available to us as a community, and we've all got to remain civically engaged. We can't just say now an election is over. Let's mm -hmm. go sit down. Let's go observe. Let's go say, okay, okay, now implement the agenda. We've got to bring the power. We've got to bring the pressure. We've got to bring the demand. We have to hold those we vote for accountable. There you go. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Good to see you, brother. Also good, good to brother. see you, my brother, Reverend Dr. Esad Yuri, Senior Vice President of Rainbow Push. Reverend Yuri, did the government's lack of equitable distribution of COVID relief funds to black businesses and churches and the black community impact African American voter turnout, do you think? Uh, I would I would argue that it did, but I think it was uh, part of a much larger uh, evaluation of what was going on around this COVID response. If we remember uh, early on, there was this kind of expectation that there would be a quick uh, recovery and, re and response in terms of the public health impact. And so the CARES Act, volume one, uh, was a bit delayed in terms of who uh, would be able to benefit. Many of the institutions that our anchors in our community were actually either left to the sideline or left out altogether. And that included access to capital institutions like CDFIs and black banks. And so what we ended up recognizing is that uh, there was this kind of hypocrisy in the policy that was emerging because as we have had a number of economic justice uh, conversations around everything from reparations uh, to community investment, uh, to restoring the health and vibrancy of black banks across the country. All of a sudden, because there were white institutional interests at play, uh, the government could find a way to start the printing press, run some fresh money, and not have to worry about the issues of deficits. And so in many ways, when we look at not just PPP in terms of how it was framed, but also in terms of uh, the moral contradictions in terms of how it was developed and rolled out, that got to be, I think, a bigger driver because what we've seen 
is that the racial wealth gap is wider. We recognize that businesses and entrepreneurs in our community are suffering, uh, that the, uh, the big banks, the white banks, uh, actually game the system. They game the system in ways that we often attribute it to being uh, some sinister behavior on the street corners of urban America, but let's just kind of frame it. You pay the banks to process PPP loans. One of the ways you can use the loan is to be able to pay the interest on a loan you might have with the bank that's processing. So I'm going to pay the bank to process money that I can get at 1% interest if it turns into a loan. So now I'm protecting my balance sheet and my assets of cash. And at the same time, making sure that because I have a privileged banking relationship, I then get the benefit of business consideration to the exclusion of others. At the end of the day, the, 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 the folks I deal with, my church is, is, is in inner city Baltimore. Uh, they know that's the hustle. And so they ran this hustle with the sanction of the U.S. government and the backing of the federal treasury against the interest of the folks who needed uh, this safety net more than in, anywhere else. I would hope that it helped to drive some interest and some participation uh, in the outcomes of the election. But it's not just the who, it's the what. Uh, if the outcome turns out that uh, we are looking at maybe a Biden presidency, uh, it's come up. The, the word of the night is agenda. If this is the old electric company uh, childhood show. The, the, the sponsoring word tonight is agenda. What is the economic agenda that turns those votes into change? And I think that is the substantive question uh, that we will have to focus on in the days to come. Reverend Jerry, of course, always right on point. And the issue is, of course, agenda. And I want to move to Melanie Campbell, who is the president of National Coalition of Black Civic Participation and the convener of the Black Women's Roundtable. Uh, Melanie, we have all in these excruciating days been wondering why we are where we are. We thought we were going to have a blue wave. We don't. Did the Biden-Harris campaign and the party invest sufficient resources in the black community in Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin and the work that you've been doing, what would you have done differently? Melanie Campbell. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Julianne, Dr. Malvo and, and my, uh, Dr. Uh, Daniels and everybody. Good to see everyone. Um, well, the party has never uh, put enough resources that, you know, that, that's one of the challenges that we all continue to push on. I can say for black women, um, I guess mm -hmm. years ago, um, now, um, especially after the 2017, yeah, three, four years ago, three years ago, after 2017, Alabama race, uh, the, the, the Jones get elected, um, and the 2018 election that we know helped the Democrats sh uh, shift power in the House, uh, that we met with the party and uh, started making demands. I know that several of us in our, in our, in our, in our, not in our day hats, but in our individual hats, uh, from the civil rights community, we met Mark and Derek, and a lot of us pushing not just the the, the DNC, but the DCCC, the, the uh, congressional um, committee, the senatorial committee, the, the governors' uh, uh, association, and all of those different uh, elements uh, to to really push back that they provide more resources and making those demands. And as and, and as far as the black women are concerned, uh, really pushing the party to understand that your thank you is not enough. And so I think that we're pushing um, um, in various ways. Is it enough? Surely not. But Julian, I can remember when we were meeting down in the uh, National Council of Negro Women Building with Dr. Height, and several of us met with the uh, uh, folks who were running for office the first time. And this would have been 2008, as a matter of fact. And I can remember that conversation where we, uh, you brought up the, the question as we were pushing the candidates and the people from the party to ask the question, what are you, how are you investing? So I think, is it enough? No. Are we moving the ball? I believe so. Is it enough? No. But I think that we're moving the ball. Okay, Melanie, thank you. Mark, next question. All right. Thank you, Melanie. And I know Mark said he was dealing with COVID and wasn't aware. Many of you know Melanie. Uh, overcame a, a very serious bout with COVID. So it is really good to see Melanie Campbell. God bless her. Absolutely. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. It's, all, it's good to be, be here with you. God be the goal. Yes, indeed. Pat, Thank you. Pastor Michael McBride, who's been on the Black 
church pack bus tour all throughout the South. Um, Pastor Mike, what other resources could the Biden Harris campaign have invested? Would you have liked to see have seen more invested in the African American community? Well, it's great to be with everyone, and uh, certainly a, a, a great big blessing to Melanie Campbell as well. I got your message on the road to keep my mask on, uh, so I, I did put my mask on. Make sure. You sure did. <laughs> That's right. I was watching. That mask. On. I, 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 I believe it's not just the amount of resources, but it is how early the resources come. We all got investments way too late. It was too little, too late. We were we were forced to be like the Hebrew slaves in the Exodus story to make bricks with no straw. Um, it is a testament to the resilience of black people in all of these particular urban centers uh, that we push through uh, all of these obstacles without resources uh, that were uh, reflective of the, the kind of level of importance of the black vote and the black turnout. And so I will I will say certainly as. Uh, someone uh, who our, our efforts were able to not only, you know, get a small vendor contract, but also uh, if it had not been for uh, the, I call it the white guilt money that flowed into many of our organizations post uh, the George Floyd uh, uprising, many of us may not have had the resources we needed to actually build a pretty robust effort of not just engagement, but organizing it. So I do believe that we must continue to push not just the presidential candidates, but the party. Um, I agree with Melanie Campbell and others who've mentioned the DCCC. Uh, these folks uh, have not done justice by our communities. Um, and I hope that we uh, focus on the, the, the success of this effort of black voters turning out and not split hairs about those who did not um, vote the right way. We should mobilize around the 90 plus percent of black voters who did turn out and save this democracy and stray away from the narratives of trying to find those uh, needles in a haystack who can't figure out all the time the right way to vote. I think that that weakens our power and it allows us to to uh, be picked off in ways that are not helpful. And so I, I do believe that we must push the candidates and, and every uh, uh, level of the political parties and the funding establishment to stop investing in, in white consultants at the expense of black firms. Stop investing in white organizers at the expense of of, of black uh, uh, pollsters and and comms folk. Uh, we got to call it out and we got to name it and we can't be afraid. And I'm certainly uh, confident that uh, the black church uh, uh, networks that we've been able to organize at an unprecedented coalition. The bishops are very much now aware of the hustle that is uh, the white uh, consulting class of the electoral system. And uh, I'm excited to bring some bishops into some conversations and to cast the devil out of the Democratic Party after we've cast the devil out of the White House. <laughs> the devil. You know, um, Mark, I'm happy to bring Dr. Ife Williams into the conversation. She is the president and CEO of the National Congress of Black Women. And hey, I want to ask you about Kamala Harris's president on, presence on the ticket. Did she really does her they send a signal to black women about our presence in the Democratic Party? Does it give us the respect that we deserve or what else has to happen? I think well, it's a symbolic thing. I think it's symbolic. Will you tell me what you think? Well, uh, Julianne, let's just say that her presence on the ticket is in the process of garnering respect that we deserve. And it is going to be up to us, should uh, she be successful, uh, it is up to us to make sure that she remembers how she got on the ticket. Because if we just take pride in the fact that she got on the ticket, that doesn't help us. I think uh, most Black women take pride in the fact that she is there because I think that moves us one step to the day when we can insist upon a Black woman, woman running for president of the United States. I, I think also that what happened was uh, having a candidate express and keep his promise is a good start. Uh, I hope that she will be there to make sure that that, uh, that candidate uh, when he becomes president, would keep more promises to us and that we would be able to go to her to help us. Um, for years, you know, we've strongly shown our loyalty to the Democratic Party. And 
and and uh, we have not benefited uh, as much as we should have. I think Kamala's presence on the ticket has at least moved us to the understanding that we must insist upon being, being classified as black women, because when we lump ourselves into that group called women, then of course, we dilute on. our strength. I know we all want to get along and we want to work with others, but unfortunately, our sisters on the other side have not been very sisterly when it comes to supporting those things that we want and that we need in our community. And so I think we uh, know that for all the talk that women did in any campaign, the presence of Kamala on the ticket strengthened our position as the greatest, most reliable supporters of the Democratic Party. And in that case, when those who win elections understand that it's important to consider what we are deserving of is greater than what we are owed if we are just lumped in with all women. That's something we've got to take care of. It's up to us, you know, to claim our prize, to insist upon an agenda for our people, not just for ourselves, but for our people. And while we are excited about Kamala, we must demand more seats at the table when the discussion is about our community. Now, there should be no doubts about our inclusion in massive numbers, not only when our community is directly impacted, but also when any subject is discussed and when and where our tax dollars are spent. We, we have a greater right to make that determination. We need more than one seat at the table. All of us as black women need to come together and make sure we are there together when we are insisting upon, insisting upon something for our communities. We deserve the lion's share of any funding for black businesses, uh, new and old. We deserve the lion's share of money for nonprofits in our communities because we give more service than anyone else. We uh, must demand a guarantee of larger um, government grants. We know that many are given out, but we don't get our share. A larger share of education funds to upgrade and operate black serving communities and institutions. And finally, a majority of all cabinet positions. I don't care who else wants them. We need to make it known early which of those positions we want should the Democratic Party prevail. And we must be more courageous than we've ever been in insisting upon our share of whatever is out there, not for ourselves, but for our community. Thank you, my sister, and thank you for your passion, Mark. Amen. Dr. E. Faye Williams. All right. Brother Jasiri ex hip hop activist founder, One Hood Media Center in Pittsburgh, PA, where they're still counting votes, as a matter of fact. But Brother Jasiri X, we want to ask you about some of these rap artists um, who got engaged with the presidential race, a couple endorsed Biden, but some a, a lot more noise was made regarding those who endorsed Trump. What impact do you think some of these rappers and hip hop artists may have had on the election? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, causing a lot of confusion. I know, um, you know, I, I, it's funny. I responded to a tweet that Ice Cube uh, put out today. Ice Cube said, uh, let me get this straight. I get I get the president of the United States to agree to put half a trillion dollars of capital in the black community without an endorsement. And niggas are mad at me. Uh, have a nice life. And uh, my response was, if you as an entertainer for over 30 years can't see how the Trump campaign used your meeting as a tacit endorsement, they built into an actual strategy to recruit other rappers, then you're not equipped to lead our community in this moment. And it's sad to me because, you know, Ice Cube is somebody who not only is a, is a talented artist, but a conscious person. And, and, you know, what happened is he really allowed himself, and I don't know if it was you know, a desire for celebrity or he wanted to try to step in in this moment. Um, it was interesting to see him step in with a contract for Black America, but not step in with the supposed scholars and folks that he said helped put this together. If Dr. Claude Anderson helped you, then why wasn't he sitting beside you to answer some of these questions? And so I really question um, a, a lot of these hip hop artists. Um, even even somebody like Diddy, two two weeks before the election, you announced a new political party or, you know, Kanye with his birthday party. I mean, you know, it to me as an artist, it looks like artists trying to find some type of light and publicity to support their other endeavors. But I think what it says to us is that, you know, we have to be careful 
about who we, with our dollars and with our influence and our platforms, make famous. We have to be careful to support these artists if they're only concerned about their sales or their bottom line and what's in their pocket. And then they want to do like Lil Wayne and go up and take a stand next to Dr. Trump and take a picture. We really got to question, you know, the amount of money that we spend on these or how we uplift these artists. We should be looking towards artists that are out here. I'll give you a great artist. Um, it's a brother named My Son, the General, um, who is uh, uh, with an organization called Unchill Freedom. He's been on the front lines all over the country. They just did a state of emergency tour. A shout out to Tamika Mallory as well. He was in Louisville helping to lead the charge, um, as, as, as well as another hip hop artist named Trader Truth out of Houston. These are some artists that we should look at what Rhapsody's doing. Rhapsody just put a song out um, in support of the movement, an incredible hip hop artist. There's another sister uh, from DC, but based in Atlanta called Cy Rock. That's an incredible conscious hip hop artist. These are the artists that we should be supporting, those that are really speaking to our community and what our community needs and talking about the liberation. Because the reality is, you know, it's a writer from Pittsburgh named Damon Young. Um, and he put out a piece that said, Joe Biden might win, but white supremacy is undefeated. And the reality is, you know, whoever wins, we still have to continue the process of liberation when it comes to our communities. All of these systems in our communities, every single one of them are not built for us and are oppressive. Every single one. Policing, education, housing, all of them are not made for us to succeed and thrive. And so we have to get on the job of our real liberation now that we've come in together. And that's why I stand with Dr. Daniel, because that's what he's always been about. But those artists that are speaking towards the liberation of our community, whether they rap, sing gospel, R&B, play the piano, whatever they do, those are the ones we should support because then we can call on them to use their platform to do good in our community. Many artists have done this. Shout out to artists like John Legend and, uh, and Alicia Keys and those artists that have been using their platform to get the word out. Um, those are the people that we need to continue to support. And the hell with all of them Negroes that stood next to Donald Trump. They should be we should we should put cancel culture in effect right now and cancel <laughs> those arguments. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, yes, sir. You know, I don't know that we need to put cancel culture uh, out there. I think that we need to just teach these Negroes mathematics. I mean, when folks say that they want to give, you no. Know, did we did we lose Dr. Malvo? We might have. It's just like we got a, a bad connection there. I'm sorry, y'all. I guess I just back. Go I, ahead. I, I'm I'm sorry. I guess I just went somewhere that I wasn't supposed to go. So that's probably You're why. I'm go right uh, here. Barbara Arnwine. Yeah. Barbara, Barbara Arnwine. Um, we have seen all kind of drama and nonsense. Um, are we getting better or worse at voter suppression? What's up with the voter suppression that we're experiencing, not only in 2020, but always? Well, you know, obviously it, it was worse in 2020. Um, and I just want to say that we started this year knowing that one of our number one obligations was to fight the devastation of the Black vote that happened in 2016, where the Black vote went down for the first time in decades. Uh, to less than, uh, you know, we had between 800,000 to 2 million less black ballots counted uh, at, in 2016. So we knew we had work to do. Uh, but we did have some new forms of voter suppression that came out this year. You know, I had already published last year in November the 61 forms of voter suppression, but that was all pre COVID. We did not know that we would have a new era of virus voter suppression uh, and that that would uh, you know, result in so many new things. Also, the heightened white supremacy of this uh, era of voter suppression, the more outright. I mean, who would have known that the RNC would announce the Republican National Committee that it would spend $20 million to stop any kind of expansion of the right to vote, that they would stop, uh, you know, drop boxes being uh, instituted, that they would stop curbside voting, that they would insist 
on your witnesses uh, in a COVID era uh, for absentee ballots, that they would win a lot of those uh, lawsuits. Who would have thought? that um, they would also uh, say they were going to put 50,000 challenges at the polls, but when they heard the brothers were going to be there in Philadelphia and other places, they changed their mind, and instead they put them in cars and sent them into Black communities with Confederate flags, uh, mm -hmm. honking, and, and threatening Black voters. That's what they did instead. Instead, they came to, as we know in Graham, North Carolina, where they tear-gassed Black voters who were marching to the polls. So, you know, so we saw some new ugly stuff. We also knew mis disinformation was going to be a real problem. And that whole wave of robocalls that went out, uh, that people had to sue over, that went out in Michigan, uh, the robocalls that went out in Florida, North Carolina, Virginia, uh, Georgia, all those, all those robocalls that said either, uh, you know, you better not vote by mail because you're going to be arrested. You better not vote by mail because you're going to be identified for uh, forced vaccine experiments. Um, the robocalls have told people that the Proud Boys were going to, quote, get you if you didn't vote for Trump. Uh, the robocalls that told people uh, that, uh, that they could vote on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday because it was going to be too busy. At the <laughs> yes, oh, they did that again, Julianne. They always roll that one out. And but the evilness of all these, you know, reductions of two thousand polling sites, and then people talk about why are there long lines? There's long lines because there aren't enough polling sites. I mean, it's it's a not you know a real hard deduction here. Uh, the other thing that we you know saw, of course, was the you know the problems uh, you know around policing, police at polling sites. Uh, in fact. I'm shocked at the amount of police stations that were designated police uh, polling sites. That's something we got to stop. And there was well, Barbara. Really quickly, let me interrupt you. What do we do about this? Yeah. Well, what we do got, we do about this? Well, there's a couple things we did real right this time, and we really educated our voters correctly. Uh, the vote early, the vote before and by the end of November third. To get all those ballots in, the use drop boxes, even though they had fake drop boxes, even though they burned drop boxes in black yeah. communities. I mean, we we did a good job. And what I think we did the best was that we we actually mustered more forces, more black clergy got involved. The divine nine showed up big time this time. Mm -hmm. uh, we had, oh yeah, they were huge this year. Uh, the black lawyers, uh, we saw young people our young people did all oh, so much mobilization. They went and stood in line for older people, got chairs. They did all kinds of stuff. I think we mobilized better. We did better education. Uh, we also, you know, we marched to polls. We did, we lifted up John Lewis's spirit and, and viewed that into all our work. I think that we did a lot of things right. Uh, because that's, there's the, that, and we told. So it's, good, so it's called so, good trouble. Good good. I'm going to turn it back over to Mark because we've got a bunch of other folks. Mark? Mark Thompson, Rev. I'm here. I was muted. I'm sorry. Um, we're also happy to have with us the convener of the policy table for M4BO, the Movement for Black Lives, Marbury um, Staley Butts. Um, Marbury, um, I was on a, a London TV interview the other day and people watching this all around the world. And some were seizing on these exit polls, which I don't really believe because you can't exit poll 100 million absentee <laughs> ballots. But yeah, you can exit them before they exit it. That's right. So there's this presumption overseas that so many black people were with Donald Trump. So the, the London um, uh, reporter asked me, whether or not this election and so much support for Trump was um, a referendum on Black Lives Matter. I think I answered the question appropriately, but how would you answer that question? What role did Black Lives Matter play in a, a lot of the choices and the main choice many in the electorate made. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I mean, so I think this is already coming up. Well, first of all, I just want to say I feel super, super humbled and honored to be part of this incredible conversation. So thank you for the invite and also thank you for all the incredible brilliance um, of the folks and the work that has been done. Um, so I mean, I would say, first of all, we're already hearing this out of kind of democratic and Republican circles as a way to yet again blame black folks um, for the decisions mostly of white folks and other folks. And so I just want to name kind of the red herring that I think it is. I think what this election and every election really is, is a reaffirmation of the anti-blackness that this country is founded on, that it continues to really triumph. And so I think it's important to name that that is both an anti-blackness, but also its twin sister and brother patriarchy, which was in showing up constantly, I think, in these conversations and in this reality. And so I would just say, I think um, there's two ways that's happening, that this is a reaffirmation of anti-Blackness. One is cultural. And so we all know the white supremacy is the mythology and the ideology that this country was really built on. And so the reality that this means people are racist is not caused by us being in the streets, not caused by us making demands. That's why we're in the streets in the first place, right? And so I think we have to realize and recognize um, that the, the basic ideological kind of logic of this country has always been one of white supremacists and white supremacy, and that continues, right? Um, as I think Virginia X really beautifully said. And then secondly, I think systematically and institutionally, um, these elections also remind us and regurgitate for us the ways in which every part of this system is inherently anti-Black. And so we know the Electoral College, Trump, I mean, um, Biden is up by 4 million votes right now. Like this would be over, done, we'd all go home. It would be a, a complete show, um, except for the Electoral College, which was really created for the sole purpose of preserving the privilege and the power of white slave owners at the, at the founding of this country. And it continues to preserve the, the power um, of mostly Southern states and states in the Midwest um, who are actively suppressing Black and Brown folk. It continues to outweigh and give them an overabundance of voice inside of this system. We also know the Supreme Court that, um, that Trump is now doing a Hail Mary to after after completely packing it himself, um, is also a relic of white supremacy, that it was created and meant for the same reason, right, that the Supreme Court is um, affirmed and confirmed and often stymied by the Senate who decides to get to be on it. And that is another relic that was meant to protect the white supremacist, white slave-owning bloc um, at the invention of this country. And so I think it's important that we name and that we say that this election is yet again a reaffirmation, even um, with Biden winning, is a reaffirmation of the white supremacy that undergoes every single system and that is the cultural milieu of this country. And so the, the incredible protest, the incredible movement for Black lives that has been, I think, um, a, a real echo, like an echo and a call for people's consciousness for the last five years and before that in the form of civil rights and Black power, um, I think is the conscience of this country. And to say that, that that constantly kind of is a challenge to the white supremacy that is reflected in these elections. And so I think our job now is really to focus on how do we demand a radical, and I say radical in a kind of Ella Baker sense, of grasping at the roots of this system. How do we demand a radical change from whoever takes office? I, clearly at this point, it's Biden who has won this race. Um, and that we demand of that new, that new president um, real change to the systems, not just the, the kind of the, the declarations of this country. And I think that that happens through organizing. So how do we support our people who are in the streets? I think a, a comrade of mine, Ash Henderson, said, when we said by any means, we meant by all the means. Right, and so how do we ensure we use the vote, the streets, um, every single method that we can, every tactic we can to get free? Wow. Yeah. Powerful girl, passion. Today, girl. Powerful passion. And you appreciate it. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. Please remember to listen, like, subscribe, and wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five star rating, and please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police-demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been made plain. Nice buns. Soft, fluffy, and ultra-low net carbs. Discover Hero Bread, the delicious ultra-low net carb bread. With incredible taste and texture, Hero Bread has zero grams of sugar and is under 100 calories per serving. Plus, high in fiber with 5 to 10 grams of protein per serving. Order from Hero.co now and get 10% off your first purchase with promo code AH10. That's 10% off with code AH10. H-E-R-O dot C-O.